Right. Good afternoon or good morning for everybody out there. Uh, thank you for attending a, another one of our ABYC uh, free webinars here. This is a great topic here. Uh, you see myself, uh, ABYC's education director on the screen, and uh, Jason Green. Uh, Green is with the New York State Division of Homeland Security Emergency Services. So he works in fire. He'll uh, give him a little brief uh, intro on himself when we turn it over to him. But I want to thank Jason for being here. You know, we've had a chance to meet a few years at some of these events, and I couldn't think of any uh, better person to present on this topic. So we're going to cover a whole lot of different things uh, for you today, and I think it's going to be uh, enjoyable. So as always, I want to start by thanking our sponsors, uh, Jap Global Asylum, uh, Safe Harbor Marinas, Vetus Maxwell, and uh, Sam's. You know, we really appreciate uh, everyone uh, stepping up and helping us out with these. We want to keep them going. It takes a lot of work on our part. So uh, thanks again to our sponsors there. Uh, some updates, not too much has changed. Uh, we still do have all of our big events coming up here uh, as far as our annual meeting and happy hour. Uh, definitely recommend you checking that out. It's run from 4.30 to uh, 6. Uh, the happy hour is the first half hour, and then we go into some of the business meeting things. If you're ever curious about how we operate or anything like that, it's an open event. Uh, I, I encourage you to attend. Um, so take a look at that. Our PTC meetings are meeting, as, as always, uh, for Standards Week. It's a little different. Uh, but that schedule is on our website. Uh, our surveyor and technician uh, program is going to be going on this year, so I'll touch on that a bit. And then we have another standards course coming up. So uh, we do have one more webinar next week for this year, and then we have one in January. So as always, you know, uh, they're open to members first uh, for registration. So take a look out for uh, that registration early next week. Uh, one of the things uh, we wanted to do as part of our uh, uh, supporting our foundation is we have this fun event we're doing become a foundation fan where we're printing off pictures of people to be in the audience for our annual meeting and our surtech event so um you know we actually have on this call today uh, upper bucks uh, county tech school palm beach state college uh, who actually has their instructor stephen spencer who was our 2020 educator of the year uh, we have some people from iris on here the northwest school of wooden boat building and new bedford regional votech school so uh, our foundation works to provide quality technicians and and support workforce development in any way we can. Uh, so Margaret's doing a fantastic job over there, but if you guys are looking for something fun and want to be in the audience for our uh, for our annual meeting and CERTEC event, you can visit the website on the screen here. Uh, and those are some of the fees, the donations that we're taking for that. And just touching on the CERTEC again, January 6th and 7th, uh, it's a virtual event. It's, it's gonna be a pretty cool two days. We have some great presenters. Uh, if you're curious on that, uh, take a look at abycsurtech.com. And not too much has changed with our online classes. We're still scheduled through uh, April, 2021. So take a look on there. We're updating all the time, adding classes. Uh, so if you're looking for certification, definitely take a look. And now into the good stuff. So CEUs, as always, uh, if you're watching this live, you'll get a follow-up email tomorrow with a link to apply for CEUs. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, there will be a link that pops up on the end for the same application for, uh, for CEUs. So you'll get them either way. Uh, just uh, you have to look at one of those two options there for yourself, depending on how you're watching it. Uh, if there's time for questions at the end, there's a little question box for you. Take a look at that. Uh, type in anything you need. We're going to hold them all to the end if we have time, uh, but that's the best way to ask questions. And next webinar is going to be next week. We have a good presentation on electric propulsion, so definitely recommend checking that one out, uh, finishing off the year strong in our webinar series. And with that, I am going to turn it over get my screen here to uh jason and uh we'll get rolling here all right so you should be able to uh accept there jason i'm gonna drop my camera and i'm seeing your presentation so uh you're good to go all right wonderful uh thank you to dave and abyc for offering us the opportunity to come and speak to you guys today it's our great pleasure my name is Jason Green. I'm an investigator with New York State Fire. I've been here probably about eight years. Uh, I am a CMI, and my agency actually conducts fire investigations for origin and cause throughout the state of New York uh, for our client group based on requests. So hopefully you get something out of this presentation, and I will make myself available for questions at the end of this, or if there's any uh, questions during, please feel free to raise your hand. So with that, 
Uh, some of the things we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about what happens with marine fire goals, and mostly we're going to be dealing with fires that deal with recreational boats right between 19 and 65 feet in length. Uh, we're going to talk about motor boats, sailing boats, yachts, and other watercraft that we may encounter out there in the world. Uh, the information that we're going to disperse here is going to be relative to the investigation of boat fires, including construction materials, some systems, and failure modes that we may look at. Uh, if you do desire additional uh, information regarding boat systems and standards, uh, it's all available at NFPA 302, along with the uh, materials printed by ABYC. Just because we limit the size between 19 meters under 65 feet in length is, is not really, excuse me, the information that we're giving you will can transcend to vessels that may be larger. So looking at some common causes of boat fires. Now this is taken from Boat US. Uh, this is the most data that I could find is from 2013. It's collected as you see here from 2009 to 2013. We're looking now our most common, if we look at the chart here and see our most common causes, they lie in the mostly electrical area. We're looking at about 41% 40 on recreational boats between DC and electric AC electrical causes. If we look at causes of fires on inboards and IOs, excluding off boat sources, we see mostly we have, again, almost 50% is an electrical type of cause. So looking at the systems that are on the boat become very, very important to the investigation and why things happened on that vessel. So between 2008 and 2012, fire ranks as the fifth largest reason for loss reported to the insurance companies. Again, looking at that, that is that is a huge amount of money that may be out there that we're, we may fail to capture a cause of. But normally it's very limited to specific and specific areas of fire origin on vessels. Either we have a vessel that we can investigate or we have a rubble pile that we're sifting through on our hands and knees and we're trying to get to the cause. Uh, the 26% of the off-boat cause in also includes exposure fires from other vessels and vessel storage in buildings, but 70% of that cause is from when the marina itself is actually involved in the fire event. And electrical causes attribute to approximately 55% of all marine fires that are occurring. So as we progress through this, Looking at marine fire investigations, we follow a systemic process that is mostly in accordance with the, the document of 921. If you guys are familiar with that, that is the methodology that is a consensus standard throughout pretty much the world of how fire investigators uh, conduct their investigations. When we look at marine fire investigations, we take all things into consideration, such as the propulsion systems, ignition sources that are on the vessel or off the vessel. Do we have cargo issues that are within that vessel? How are we going to document this fire? How we how we examine that vessel? Uh, marine vessels that are within structures. There are legal considerations that we have to be concerned with when we look at marine fire investigations. We will most likely and almost always preserve the scene. You may have public agencies involved, such as myself, or maybe a law enforcement capacity. And as we're looking at larger events of fires within the marine world, you may have different insurance carriers involved. And again, they have their own you know, representatives that are trying to preserve their the rights of their clients and uh, look out for the best interests of their insured. So when we're looking at marine fire investigations, the thing that we need to do is we need to size up the overall situation. How large is this event? What we see on the left here is a single single vessel out in the water. I believe this is on Canandaigua Lake. This is upstate New York. Uh, really small resources here, maybe just one insured company. If we look at the picture on the right, we actually have a, a marina here where we may have multiple vessels that are sunk. Now we're dealing with the insurance company of the marina. We're dealing with the insurance of the vessels themselves. Maybe there's some uh, environmental impacts that we have to look at. So based on the size of the situation depends on how complex we're going to get. And segueing right into that, 
looking at marine fires, we have basically two types of marine fires that we look at. We have what's called a simple marine fire or we have a complex marine fire. Marine fires that are classified as simple are normally a single or a limited number of boats that are involved, very limited amount of damages. What's to know here is that there's no real monetary value that says that this is a simple or a complex. It's basically how, how detailed or how involved the, the scene gets. Normally we have a single or very few insurance companies. You may have a few governmental in, agencies involved. Low profile, maybe some media exposure. Uh, this fire you're looking at happened in uh, December 31st, 2018. It broke out in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, this was a 48-foot boat that was at uh, uh, Bahia Mar in Fort Lauderdale. Again, very simple fire, one boat involved for now. But again, as, as we know about the nautical environment, just a little wind shift and we could be dealing with all the vessels that are actually behind them or ones that may be in joining structures. This again, a very, very simple fire. Now we break into the complex, multiple boats, massive damage, multiple insurance companies, multiple governmental agencies involved, very high profile. And what I tell what I tell guys here where I work is, do you think you're gonna see this on the news? Is this gonna is this event worthy enough to catch the news, the news cycle? One boat, maybe. Uh, but if you see right now, we see this is from 2014, you had seven boats sink and several more severely damaged. And this was in Washington at Shelter Bay Marina. But do you think that sells newspapers? If you're there and you start looking at these fires, this is a large loss event. This is gonna, this is going to get the media to come in and look at what what happened. There, this is gonna get someone's attention. Now, looking at that, we can again we just dealt with the marine world. Now, marinas. Are pretty much the same thing. We want to look at what, how, how big is the damage? Did we have a fire event in the building on the left? If so, we don't see much damage. But if we look to the building, if we look to the the dockage on the right, again, everything is destroyed. There may be multiple vessels that are compromised there. I can see one that's already sunken. Again, same thing. We want to size up the situation. We want to look at how big is this event? What type of facility are we looking at? Do we have safety concerns about that facility? Well, we're gonna look at the systems and we're gonna identify the systems that are there. What is their function? Uh, what are our environmental concerns? Do we have runoff? Do we have uh, particular problems with air monitoring that we need to deal with? Construction, how is, the, how is that building built? And again, media exposure. This photo that you're seeing here is actually from Pottsboro, Texas. It actually destroyed 20 boats and caused millions of dollars damage. And this was, uh, the cause was actually brought down to a uh, man was moving water from a gas tank when he, when a clamp from the electrical pump fell on some metal and sparked. Uh, this fire actually burnt for about six hours before it was extinguished. So when we look at marinas, guys, there are Two different facilities we talk about. We have a, a dry storage and a wet storage. This is basically a dry storage facility. As we see, the boats are palletized, they're they're held in racks. Again, very good pathway. If we have fire that starts in one of these one of these vessels, it's very easy to progress up, even through just natural fire progression, burning up and out. If we experience a fire on the on the first row here say it uh, looks like a b154 in the corner here with that little 200 if we had just had normal fire progression we're going to have it's going to be very very difficult to localize damage in our area of origin it may be very difficult to uh, trace back we have what's called wet storage where the boats actually remain in the water but they are stored uh, this is from a facility down in florida Again, when we're getting air, we're going to start looking at safety concerns. The wet storage often presents a quite a different and more difficult challenge to the investigators. 
so as we're starting with the investigation, we want to make sure we size up the overall situation. We want to identify the safety concerns. Is there flooding? Is the boat is the boat or the craft stable? Do we have the appropriate level of PPE, including respiratory protection? Uh, do we need to undertake dewatering? Do we need to make that vessel stable? How do we do so? How are we going to identify the resources that we need and we're going to get them back? Uh, is the shore based power onboard batteries, have they been secured and rendered safe for us? Did we de energize them? No matter what happens, guys, remember on fire investigations, we are forensic. And I tell this to our, our fire guys a lot. I, I, in the fire world, we risk a lot to save a lot. Being forensic, there's no, we're, we're not going to take that large of a risk because there's really no life safety. We're, this is property for us. So we're going to make sure that we render everything safe and work in the safest environment that's possible for us as investigators. Uh, for anybody who wants to reference this, you can see NFPA 921. Uh, again, I didn't update this to the 2021 slide, but in the 2000 edition, uh, 30.1 through 30.3512 goes through the safety concerns that have to be identified for investigators. Or if you have the uh, fire investigator textbook, that would be 400 and 403. We look here, this is a, a complete loss. This vessel is actually being removed from the, from the water. Uh, just look at the gentleman here. He is very nicely wearing his, his life preserver, but do we think that's the safest place to stand while that vehicle is being raised out of the water? Uh, I don't put much faith in those change uh, with me. Murphy's Law always comes into play, so I'd rather be out of the collapse zone or where that could fall in hurt myself or any of my team. Uh, there are certain things that investigators have to know how suppression efforts can alter fire pattern development. Again, with boats, most boats compartmentalize things. So that will affect the fire patterns and the fire growth within that boat. Uh, you have to be aware of ventilation controlled fires, fuel fed fires, things like that. And if, if you are not a fire investigator, make sure you seek out the assistance of a certified fire investigator to help you uh, identify this. Uh, we want, again, we wanna make sure that craft is stable. You may need to use a skilled diver. Where, where is that coming from? Where are you getting, where are you getting the money for those, those individuals to go down and uh, do their mapping? Uh, if the vessel is sunk, there may be items of evidentiary value that may rest on the, uh, the body of water's floor. Uh, are you going to grid that out? How are you going to map that out where it was actually collected from? Again, looking for the, trying to maintain that evidentiary value and how we collected it is of ultimate importance to us. Again, we talk about power and battery systems. We must de-energize them. We want to pre prevent shock or electrocution. Boats by nature may be all confined spaces. If you go below decks, maybe into an engine space, bilge, we want to conduct air monitoring. In the products of combustion that we're seeing now, a prevalent gas that's out there is uh, hydrogen cyanide. Just that's just through natural combustion products. It is uh, it is highly uh, affinitive to the hemoglobin of the body, about 300% more. So we need to make sure that we have the, the air monitoring that can actually collect that data. Most four gas meters that most people may have may not be suited for that type of gas. So if you do have a air monitoring unit, please make sure that it can capture the gases that are most uh, dangerous to you. We talk about airborne particulates. Again, boats have a lot of fiberglass, things like that. Anybody that's worked in the area around fiberglass knows that no matter how you try to stop getting the fiberglass on you, you're always gonna end up itchy. So imagine if we aerosolize that through the products of combustion or through suppression, and now we're down in a hold and we're breathing this stuff in. Again, not a good way for us to be. And let's just take that extra moment of time, ensure our respiratory protection, ensure that we're gonna remain healthy and start our investigation. So as we look at the investigation, we're starting to proceed and we're starting from where this vehicle, uh, vessel may be. Remember vessels that are berthed at a dock or wharf may utilize a shore power connection or to power their ancillary systems. 
the investigators or the surveyors when they're starting to, to survey their scene or do the scene itself, they should document the type, the voltage, and any protection systems of that marine shore power system. That may mean you have to leave from the pedestal and go back to the main feed. Is anything there tripped? Was there any evidence of arc fall? Start, work, work your way from the farthest point back to the scene. You wanna make sure you, you capture the best shot of that environment as you can. Again, here, third time you're seeing it. Ensure all systems are de-energized. This, uh, this photo you're seeing up here is a marine shore power utilizing marine grade cords supplied through a double female connection from a pedestal. This is actually a very common occurrence out here. Uh, I'm on Long Island, New York, and we see this a lot down by us in our, in our docks and our uh, marinas. I use this, this picture a lot because I don't know who this electrician was, but I want him to come and work in my house. I have never seen such meticulous work. Um, when we get down into this, this hold here, we wanna look at the energy sources and hazardous materials. Remember, if we're going down and the, and the system is actually intact and it has not been disabled or suppression has not destroyed it completely, we wanna document those sources before we disable them. Again, we're not gonna, we're gonna render them safe for us. Monitor the atmosphere before disconnecting the cables. Is anything off gassing down there? down here in this confined space, I, I want to know what's off gassing down there. We want to disconnect the DC input and then disconnect the, the shore connections as well. Remember, boats may have a sewage holding tank. They may have methane leak. They may have biological hazards that may be free floating within the vessel. And we want to make sure that we at least maintain some level of safety for that. I don't know if you guys want to be down in, you know, just cloth coveralls in a in a bottom of a bilge that may have sewage in it, but maybe we'll have to put some hip waders on or some higher boots. Again, talking about structural concerns, operations that occur just through suppression may cause instability. The the fact of the boat being consumed through the product, through the act of combustion may change where the center of gravity of that vessel is. May do, the introduction of the water during suppression may cause instability. The decking or other components may be damaged by fire. You may not see it. The, maybe the damage is within a hold and it's affecting the, the support systems of the deck. You go to step on it, and next thing you know, you, you find yourself in a hole. Uh, unprotected openings may be concealed. Again, be very, very cautious and look around and make sure that vessel is safe before you get on board to do your, your documentation. When we step out we, on the wharves, jetties, or docks, uh, they may be slippery or unstable. They may have, if the fire department decided to use foam, again, we're, how is our footing? With submerged vessels, we're not going to board them. You're going to monitor them from the surface is what you're going to do. And you're going to be aware of watching for any harmful products escaping into the water. Oil is our big thing. Uh, oil, we want to make sure we report that. Gasoline is bad, but it's not as bad as, as oil. So submerged vessels, what are we going to do if, if we had a fire on them? We're going to have them raised and we're going to remove them out. And again, once they're removed and they're out of, that, out of the water area, we're going to make sure that they're stable and then we're gonna to begin to document our scene. You may have visual distress signals and pyrotechnics. Again, secure them to prevent accidental activation during your, your, your survey process. Again, looking at that overall picture, the, the totality of the circumstances that we talk about here, look at environmental concerns. Do we have to boom, boom around the scene? Do we have to call the Coast Guard for possible pollution? Is there a local agency that's involved? Is there a local Department of Environmental Conservation that, that's called? These are all things that we may be faced with when we're dealing with an investigation. So 
stepping away from safety and moving towards the ignition sources. A vessel fire is often similar to, has the same type of ignition sources found in structural and vehicular fires. In addition, we may see turbochargers, exhaust manifolds. Uh, the picture you're seeing right there is a racing exhaust manifold as installed. We wanna make sure as, as we're looking into our fires, that marine grade parts are utilized when examining the vessel. Uh, any investigator that comes to do a fire should understand the vessel's mechanical and electrical systems. And this is where I really give kudos to the to surveyors because the surveyors and people certifer, certified by ABYC, they are a technical resource of, they are, they are just an amazing wealth of knowledge for investigators. And when I, when I talk about utilizing the fire investigation team, if I'm dealing with anything with Marine, I'd want, a cert, I'd want somebody certified from either ABYC or a certified surveyor to come and help me with this because they can maybe lead me in a direction that I might not uh, be familiar with. We look at fuel gas systems on board the vessel. We may have cooking, heating, generators. Uh, big thing here is you want to make sure you take samples of all the fluids if you can for analysis or you know a pre pre fire condition. Are they using the right fluids? Is the fluid showing wear? Does it is it the wrong fluid? Did they replace it with something they shouldn't? A couple of vehicles that we had they actually took brake fluid and replaced it into the transmission fluid. So one brilliant scholar I had actually. I think it was a little intentional, put gasoline into the winter washer fluid. Not the, not the best outcome. So what we're looking at here is this is a Kohler uh, generator system on, up top and down below is a marine grade air conditioning unit. Again, start looking at these areas for failure. Even though we have uh, backfire arresters, backfire vents through carburetors are still a common occurrence. Uh, inboard and IO vessels have black fire flame arresters. Uh, they are still possible to occur through these devices if the arrestor is dirty or faulty. Uh, investigators should actually look at these devices to make sure they do have the marine approval. As you see on the k and filter that's here, it is actually labeled uh, marine approved under the SAE standard. We're going to start talking inside. Does the vessel have a galley? If the vessel has a galley, we're going to look at the type of cooking devices they have. Remember, pilot uh, pilot appliances with pilot flames are prohibited on gasoline fueled vessels. What you're looking at here is an alcohol-fed stove, and uh, this is very easy to ascertain through interview with the individuals. A couple of things to consider when we're looking at electrical sources: uh, components not rated for watercraft use. The picture here on the right is showing a ten. They're both ten gauge wire. Uh, the left is uh, automotive grade, which is SAE, and the right is and the right is marine grade or AWG, and we see the difference in the construction of these wires. And again, both 10 grade, 10 gauge. Excuse me. Do we see this a lot, though, guys? Do we? This happens, doesn't it? Guy decides that my boat's not working right, or I'm popping breakers. Oh, this wire shorted out a little bit. I got a little bit of corrosion on it. You know what? Instead of going to the brain supply place and Paying double the price. Let me go to Auto AutoZone and I'll just grab a piece of 10 gauge wire and I'll, I'll wire it in. And again, it doesn't. It's not built to withstand the the rigors of the marine environment. Another thing we need to look at is the overcurrent devices replaced with oversized fuses. Well, my 10 gauge, my 10 amp fuse keeps popping every time I start. So I'm actually going to go grab a 20 amp from AutoZone. I'm going to plug that in. Again, is, is, is that a problem? It, it very well could be. There, maybe the, the, the 20 amp fuse you're replacing it with is not ignition protected. Uh, overloaded wiring. We're, we're seeing that more and more as people go on their boats and they're, they're, we're more technology dependent. How many plugs are on a boat? Well, you bring your friends out, all of a sudden everybody's got you know six, seven phones out there. We need to wire in phones or we wanna have these aftermarket lights. We're going to start having Christmas parades up here. Are we are we overloading the electrical systems within the boat? Things we need to look at, guys. Some facts to consider: electrical short circuiting and arcs. 
Again, you see the picture here. This is a shoreline connection. Uh, corroded electrical connections, it just happens, especially in the saltwater environment. It's very, very rough on any type of metals or systems that are on the water. You guys know this already. ABYC has a whole thing on corrosion. Uh, lightning, is there any lightning strikes in the area? There are, there are reports that you guys can get. That we actually use, uh, and I'm not eliciting a brand here, we use StrikeNet, which gives us any electrical activity within the last 24 hours. We also use Weather Underground. So if you think that lightning may be involved in your ignition source, that, that's a very easy way to ascertain has there been any lightning activity within the area while your vessel was, was either underway or making way or birth. We want to look at static electricity and arcs. We see this a lot with fueling. People fail to ground themselves uh, or they, they don't fuel the right way, operate the blower motor. They cause an elect static electricity and they cause an arc and next thing you know, we have an explosion. Some photos here we want to look at. Uh, uh, picture one is a fault through a shoreline connection. Uh, again, now, as we're looking at this, if this actually can consume the whole boat, how easy is this going to get to get it to, to uh, recreate? Probably very difficult, but again, using a systematic method, removing things in layers, looking at all sides of an object, we may be able to get back to this. Something like this, if this was actually consumed, maybe you want to conduct your interviews and talk to talk to the the owner. What happened? What was going on? Uh, picture two here on the top right, that's a failure of a wiring harness. Again, if we look at that, how much damage do we actually have in that engine compartment? Not really much. So very lucky to get that shot. The bottom here, though, this is the heating of a battery cable connector. And we see that there was, some, there was a lot of heat that passed through here. How many of you guys actually believe that you might be able to find this during recreation? I know it's difficult in a web form, but if we do proper reconstruction, we trace this back and we, we very may well be able to, to see the beating or the sleeving or some evidence of arc fault within the electrical system just by doing an examination from here. A uh, little thing for you guys, if, uh, if anybody actually does do this and you find something like this, you wanna take a good photo of this, we use a blue background. Just, I basically use a, a color sample from one of the Home Depots or big box stores and just put it back there behind blue and it actually makes it pop out better give you a nice crisp picture of uh, the damage you're trying to highlight. Talked about it before, hot surfaces, and I mentioned with replacing a fuses, marine protecting ignition. Are these items in place? Did they function? Are they maintained or replaced with suitable substitutes? Again, start talking with people. Talk to, talk to the individual. Did you do any work on the boat? Did the boat have any problems that you really worked with? Was there any issues that you saw with the operation of the vessel? This You may be able to recover these. Again, x-ray may be able to help you to let you know if they're open, maybe a continuity tester. Get into that interview. Start talking with the, the individuals. You'd be surprised with what you can get just by talking to them over a cup of coffee. We talk about certain things with cargo. Again, on a recreational vessel, it may not be be too um, too pertinent, but out here by us, where I live, we have a lot of people that tend to bring materials over for their summer house on, on the island. So you never know what's over on the vessel as they're going over. We want to try to make sure that we don't have incompatible materials stored near each other or shipped in the same container or location. If it's a commercial vessel, you wanna make sure you review that vessel manifest, which will be in the wheelhouse and it actually has to be maintained by the master of the vessel. So now when we document our marine vessel fires, we're gonna document just like we would in an automobile fire. Pretty, pretty similar. 
if the vessel is on land, we're going to look for the location of the fire, where they are. Um, we actually grab GPS coordinates. That does help a lot of times when you're creating your origin and cause report. Uh, terminating shore power. Was it operational? Was it not operational? Was there any fault? Was there any recent power spikes in the area or was there civil disturbance? Look at the connections themselves. Is there any evidence of corrosion? Is there any evidence of failure, arc failure? Look at the surrounding area. Now, the surrounding area is, do I have evidence of theft? Is, is there theft there? Uh, is there any civil unrest? Look for signs of vessel abandonment. Did they try and scrape the, the registration off the boat? Did they try and remove the hint? Do you have to get to the confidential hint to try and figure out where this boat is? Uh, we experienced a rash of these that would just show up at uh, town docks. All of a sudden, a vessel would just show up tied up to the, to the dock, and the rear transom would be cut out, the engine would be missing, and all the letters would be taken off. These were all vessels that were sunk and raised during Sandy. If, you, if you're doing an in-water investigation that, and that vessel is stable, Please remain on the line. determine whether the vessel is at the location where the fire occurred. Did it move? Was, again, we just experienced a whole bunch of storms up here. Did that vessel break free of its mooring or its dock and drift? Again, we want to look at the power connection and conditions that are at where the vessel is found. We want to look at ignition sources and potential fuels. You may have to get divers. If the vessel is moored, what is the material of that pier or dock? Is that part of the fuel package? Is it our area of origin, or is that just an exposure problem with the with the pier of the dock? Please remain on the line. Biggest thing here is interviews. We want to make sure that we look, we talk to the the individual. Was the vessel operational? Was it being worked on? Did they have anything? installed recently? Did they do maybe a new radio system or a sound system? Did they put new air conditioning in? All things that possibly would be repaired. What was the weather like? Was it clear and sunny like it is today with you know, it's a balmy 33 degrees down here? Or was it heavy overcast, thunderstorms, high wind warning? We want to ask the, the interviewee, what did you do after you saw the flyer? One of the fires that we did down here, uh, you actually heard him over channel 16. He has, he says over 16, my vessel's on fire. My wife and kids jumped in the water and I'm leaving the boat. Okay. So as we talk to him and we're, we're discussing with him what actually happened, we get a small snapshot what happened over 16. But what actually happened was he said that as he was underway making way towards towards the island, he experienced a complete loss of power, loss of control of the vessel, and he smelled smoke. All important for us as we're going back and we're looking at origin or trying to find a causation factor. Uh, what salvage operations are going on? And again, if you guys don't interview people a lot, or most of the times if you do, you know that other questions develop as a result of the interview itself. Let them talk. If they're talking and they want to give you information, let them get, let them keep giving you information. Use open-ended questions. Keep them talking. Make them comfortable with you. Uh, what you're looking at here is a boat fire that happened in 2016 in Rockaway Park, New York. Uh, this gentleman's boat exploded at about 5:30. He said he just started his boat and it just went boom. So if you have nothing else but that, the guy says, well, I just started my boat and went boom. What are we thinking? Did he, one question I would ask him is, did you operate your blow motor? So, so as we're looking at marine vessels, we're winding down now. We've only got a couple more slides. I appreciate you bearing with me. 
Uh, we want to determine the construction design features that would affect that fire and development and growth. Again, how compartmentalized is that vessel? If I'm operating on a pontoon boat in the middle of a lake, am I going to have the same fire growth that's on a 40 foot cabin cruiser with you know a salon? We want to try and obtain an exemplar. Go and get the owner operator's manual and sales literature. Look for a recall database. When we do this, we always search for recalls and that's part of our information package. There's a couple of resources we'll talk about in a second. When we look at the area of origin, where is it coming from? Is it from the cockpit or the top side of the vessel? Is it within the engine or fuel compartment? Is it in the accommodation compartment of the cabin? Or is it down in the bilge area? Follow that systematic process working from least damaged to most damaged and document your procedure along the way. You should follow that same systemic process every fire, evaluating each compartment, and you want to be cognizant of what's called compartmentalization and ventilation-related patterns as it goes to fire development. We'll look at the exterior of the boat. We want to make sure we, with slope services, we may have a very limited amount of vertical spaces and offsets in the accommodation space. This is actually going to affect normal fire development. After we find the area of origin, again, a detailed exam and document of the area should be conducted. This should be done in accordance with someone that is a certified fire investigator. Uh, we should look at the fuel system, the tanks between the tanks, fuel fill, vent hoses, the ground between the tank fill plate, the tank. Is there evidence of corrosion? Is there evidence of electrical activity there? We wanna look at the position of the switches, the handles, the port lights, the hatches, what was going on? Some of the vessels I, that I worked on actually had six batteries. They would have two for the engine, two for the house, and then there would be another two for the ancillary equipment, such as the emergency lighting and things like that. Note where everything is. If we have a vessel that goes in within a structure, it may be within a garage or carport, they may be the source of ignition, or they might just be a an exposure or an additional fuel package ancillary to where the fire started. We want to examine the sources of ignition within that space ex itself. Look for electrical service to and on floating docks. Remember, damage from corrosion to movement may relate to the fire. If we have a dock that has the pedestals out there and nobody maintains them for five years in a saltwater environment, how much corrosion can we see? What about stray current? Things like that. Make sure you start looking. As we're winding down now, guys, remember there's some legal considerations that we need to look at. You may have to deal with the federal court. They may hold jurisdiction. We still have to worry about search and seizure. We have the right of entry. We have spoliation and other potential issues that we have to worry about. Do we have multiple insurance agencies that are out there? Are they on notice? Again, we wanna try and retain everybody's rights and. Again, we don't want to be anywhere near trying to destroy evidence that may uh, hamper an investigation. The EPA and the Coast Guard may be involved if the spilling of fuel or contaminants into the water. Uh, if the fire is what's called incendiary, which means the person who lights the fire knows that it shouldn't be lit and they light it anyway, uh, may involve US Coast Guard or local port authorities, or it may involve uh, local municipalities such as local law enforcement or other. Uh, Investigate, investigatory agencies. Some resources available for you guys if you, you see that you need help. Uh, the N NICB, the National Insurance Crime Bureau is an amazing resource for you guys. Uh, Boat History Report is a very good resource to get exemplars. Uh, IAMI is a very good resource for you guys. So as I'm just wrapping up here guys, I'm, I'm right at about 12.45 so just as marina fires can be some of the most difficult and dangerous fires to extinguish, they can also be the same during the investigation of their cause. Remember, safety is our number one priority here. You have to be prepared to use alternative methods of investigation, maybe specialized equipment. Uh, most of the time, those specialized equipment incurred increased course, cost and cost more time in order for have our, to have our investigations be successful. Uh, calling for help is not a sign of weakness, guys, not at all. Remember, these are specialized fires. There are specialized resources that have to be there. And in order to maintain a unbiased 
investigation with a a final hypothesis that withstands a scientific method, we need to be consistent and let's see, true in our in our evaluations of what we're doing. With that, guys, I, I really have nothing else. If there's any questions, I will refer it back to Dave. And thank you very much for having me speak this afternoon. Thanks a lot, Jason. It's uh, we really appreciate it. Just such a good perspective. I think it's one that uh, you know a lot of people, whether you're a technician, a surveyor, or a boat owner, you just don't know what uh, how the behind the scenes work in situations of fire or whatever it might be. So it's just uh, it's really great getting to share that insight, and I really appreciate it. Uh, we do have some questions that have come in here. Start reading them off. We do have some time. So uh, there have been numerous fires and explosions on classic uh, pre-regulation boats. Do you have an opinion on how these vessels should be treated? Well, any vessel when we're dealing with a fire investigation, we're we're going to treat everything. I always treat everything as if it's a crime scene first, and then I just treat every fire the same way. So I, I mean, I may be missing part of the question here, but whether the boat is the boat is 40 years old or if it's three years old. The investigation process is going to be the same and we're going to work from the least damage to the most damage and we're going to evaluate every system the same way every time so basically having that that system on how you investigate a fire and using that same methodology every time gives you a more credible or not, not really credible but it gives you a basis that the age of the vessel really doesn't matter all right, uh, next question. In the case of a fuel leak on an inboard uh, and resulting explosion during start, what is your experience with finding uh, the source of ignition when the boat is heavily consumed? Again, with, with seeing vessels that are heavily consumed, it's very, very difficult. Very, very difficult. Dealing with, you have to basically start with interviews and remember the boat will tell us a lot just like a building a, a building or a boat will tell us a lot people fill in the gaps so we're going to start again with the interviews very very difficult with the explosion again where was this occurring it was it in water at a fuel dock or were these guys offloading their boat after just filling up at the local gas station because they didn't want to pay the gas prices on the gas stock price and they go down but it again it's it's difficult to do it and i'm not going to say it's it's easy in any part any fire is actually very difficult to do but again it's it's meticulous and with explosions especially boat explosions you know you, you may have items of evidentiary value that are propelled very far away so how large is your scene going to be Right. Uh, have you seen any change in, uh, what does it say? Has there changed battery technology such as lithium ion caused an increase in electrical fires in your experience? I have not had any experience with that. I actually just dealt with this issue on another, another investigation I had where I actually got to speak to the University of Michigan's battery lab in uh, Michigan. And some of the lithium ion batteries there are actually very, very viable for a ignition source and the off gassing and the resulting consumption that occurs within that battery is very very viable for a ignition source but if they if they wish you can have them uh, contact me through my email and i'll actually give them that individual's name he was very helpful right do most uh fires occur with people on board or not didn't miss didn't miss we we see a lot of fires here on on the upstate, not upstate, or the uh, South Shore Long Island area, most of our stuff occurs when people are underway. Well, we we are a very very seasonal area, so from May to September, people are on the water, and that's when we normally see most of our fires. And it, it's hit or miss whether they're underway making way or if they're birthed. Right. Do you have many fires set for insurance purposes? Well, I don't. I don't personally, but 
it, it does cause me concern. And with the people that are here, I'd be, I would say with the current economic situation that's occurring within the country right now, the prevalence is that we could start to see maybe a very large amount of people that can't afford their luxury item anymore. So again, my advice would say that treat every fire that occurs on a vessel as a potential crime scene. Right. At what point does a cause and origin investigation become available for public consumption? Public consumption? Or when is it released to the uh, to the to the private side? Yeah, I think that's what he's going for, for the public to review it. I guess. Yeah. Uh, again, I I I dealt with. I am a I am a public uh, sector investigator. And I am strictly origin and cause. That is my job. My job is basically to find criminality. If I don't have criminality, I give it right, right over to uh, the private guys. Every investigator is different. I never have a, I never have a real issue working right alongside the private guys. Uh, we do have a very lengthy process because we have a peer review and administrative review process in our agency. After I author my origin and cause. It has to go through that process, so it is a little delayed, but I believe it gives us some of the, one of the best products for origin and cause reports in the state. But normally it could be anywhere between three to four months for a public finding to come out, depending on how large the uh, case is and what other ancillary investigations may be concerned after that. Right. What are the most common mistakes or causes of fires you've seen in shipyards? Hot work. A lot of a lot of things you see, guys, with hot work uh, uh, and uh, battery chargers. I've seen a couple up here where people put uh, batteries on trickle chargers, or they try and charge them up real quick, and they just leave them on. They forget them. Right. If someone is interested in becoming a fire investigator, where would you recommend they start? Absolutely. If uh, if you actually have any questions about being a fire investigator, uh, if you have any questions of being one here in the state of New York, I will uh, be more than happy to, David has my contact. I will be more than happy to speak to anybody here. I would recommend that you go out to the IAAI, the International Association of Arson Investigators, or the National Association of Fire Investigators. They have an excellent training program and they can help you out and get you on your path to becoming a fire investigator. Right. Uh, have you encountered uh, boats with fixed fire suppression systems that have failed or been insufficient? Well, you got to remember, yeah, I have not encountered that, but when these systems are actually designed, they're designed for a certain fire load and with modifications and changing the fuels and furnishings and things like that, uh, it can be very well overcome. When you're dealing with furnishings, uh, I, I say this a lot, when we look at a, a what's called a legacy room or room that had natural materials that were, com that were constructed way back when, when I was a little kid, where everything was cotton and wood, now you look at things that are made out of the, the foam. They're all made out of foam and that's a petroleum based product. So you're seeing what's called heat release rate. Uh, that is how, how much heat the product of combustion gives off. If you look at gasoline, a gallon of gasoline is about 20,000 BTUs per pound. The foam that's now in some of these uh, materials is about 21,000. So you basically have gasoline in a foam that's in these areas that are compartmentalized. So again, with that rapid amount of heat being released, is that suppression system now overtaxed that it can't be, it can't keep up with the new materials that have been introduced. All right, I think we've got time for a couple more here. Uh, what are the legal ramifications when a technician uh, is asked to work on a vessel with obvious and dangerous electrical issues? If you touch one part, are you liable for all parts? That's a little out of my purview. Uh, I, I'm not sure uh, if I know if, if it delves in the realm of fire investigation. I tell every investigator I've ever worked with, I got, and I'm not claiming credit for this. It was given to me by my mentor. Small tools equal big trouble. Uh, I don't take anything apart. I'm not looking for the cause of the cause. So, but again, if uh, when it's dealing with liability and things like that, I'm to 
what somebody touches uh, that's a little bit out of my purview. So as far as your experience and what you've seen, I think this will be our last question here. What is the best thing a boat builder can do to prevent boat fires? Diligence, diligence. Make sure your hot work is being run right. Make sure that you're just doing basic sanitation around. Don't leave oily rags. Make sure fuel spills are spilled are cleaned up. Make sure your systems that you have within the facility are being maintained according to their to the manufacturer's direction or the applicable building code. Um, everybody doesn't like when the code enforcement guy shows up, but there's a reason they're there. And most of our codes are reactive and based in loss of life or loss of property. So basically maintain your equipment and maintain your the safety systems that are there. All right. So with that, we're going to wrap it up. We're going to jump back on screen again. So thanks again, Jason. I know uh, it, it's a different perspective for a lot of our members and voters and technicians out there to kind of see uh, behind the scenes of what they may be dealing with in the case of a boat fire out there. So I really appreciate the insight. I want to thank our sponsors again, uh, Dabsco Rules Island, Safe Harbor Marinas, Vetus Maxwell, and Sam's. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, with that, uh, Jason, thanks again. Um, and we will see all of you next week for our last webinar of the year. Take care, everyone, and uh, enjoy your week. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, guys.